please like feel free to introduce yourself in the chat and um, tell us where you are right now and uh, where are you showing us from. And we're also going to be doing a small uh, Mentimeter poll because we want to know whether um, this project that we have been um, moving forward is actually uh, useful for you as an um, institution. Um, and so with that being said, this session is about the Declaration on Open Access to Cultural Heritage. And um, Fiona, Romeo, Andra Wallace, and myself are going to be presenting this session. But before we move on, uh, Fiona, would you like to introduce yourself? Yes, hello, I'm Fiona Romeo. I'm the Senior Manager for Glam and Culture at the Wikimedia Foundation. Great. Um, Andrea? Uh, hi, I'm Andrea Wallace. I'm a senior senior lecturer in law at the University of Exeter in the United Kingdom, obviously by my accent. <laughs> no one could have told. Um, and I'm Evelyn Heidel, uh, and I'm uh, currently working on the Open Glam Initiative, where we're uh, sort of doing this project and many other projects uh, with Creative Commons. Um, great, and I see that people can only like uh, speak to panelists, not to each other, um, which is kind of um, sad because uh, this is a great set of attendees that we have already um, by just looking at the presentations. Um, but anyway, thanks uh, a lot for being here. Um, and with that being said, I want to um, uh, go ahead and get started. And um, this is sort of a call. Um, to um, ask you um, in particular that if you're interested in following any of the topics, uh, particularly with regards to copyright and intellectual property um, and open access uh, to cultural heritage, uh, please, please consider uh, joining the special interest group on intellectual property at uh, MCN. Um, and there's the link um, there um, that of course, like you can all see uh, click because um, um, I don't know if you can have access to um, my presentation, but in any case, there's um, this um, link that you can show in if you go to the mcn.edu uh, website anyways. And if not, you can also show in uh, now there's a Slack channel on the MCN uh, Slack um, and there's a Slack channel for the special interest group on IP. And uh, we want to start with this being a little bit more interactive. Um, so what we're gonna propose to you, if you can go to this uh, address, which is menti.com, code free free three nine zero four eight, And I'm gonna ask uh, either Crystal or Amy if they can um, um, share the uh, code um, in the chat, since I think they are the only ones authorized to send messages to all the participants. Um, that would be great, so they can have easy access to that. So it's menti.com. Ah, there we go. Fiona can do that too. Um, so while we are there, I'm going to go to my Mentimeter presentation um, and start presenting. So where our first question is, um, how much do you know about copyright, open access to cultural heritage, creative commons, decolonization, and traditional knowledge? Um, this is kind of a way for us to actually know what's sort of your level of confidence uh, with some of the topics that we'll be presenting today. And I see some answers already coming in. This is very fun. Like we do it only because we like like this sort of like, oh, this is our best presentation mode. Um, we sort of um, start saying funny things in the middle. I see that a lot of people feel more confident with copyright than with anything else. Um, we very much welcome all the copyright nerds out there in the room. We embrace you. We want you in this conversation. Oh, wow. And this is like the best Mentimeter that we have had ever so far. Like already 68 people uh, filling it in, 70. That's great. This is great. And so for those of you who are just joining, uh, we're doing this uh, small poll. Um, so if you go to menti.com, free, free, three, nine, um, zero, zero, four, eight, um, we're sort of filling that. Okay, so kind of right in the middle, um, following a little bit, a little bit more on the more knowledgeable side. Um, 
This is great. Um, for those of you who are just joining, please feel free to keep on. Um, I think you can keep on uh, filling the uh, poll, even if we move to the next slide. So I'm going to do that. I'm going to move to the next slide. And this is a very interesting question because uh, with um, Andrea, we have been also presenting in uh, Europe, in a lot of European conferences and in the European context. So I know that for uh, folks out there in the US, um, most of you don't necessarily claim rights on the digitalization of the collections, but we are sort of trying to understand um, whether folks are claiming some type of rights on the digitalization of their collections, whether it's through a Creative Commons license um, or uh, whether it's through a direct copyright statement. So I see that there are a lot of yes and no answers, mainly no, um, which is good. And then a substantive uh, portion that really doesn't know, which is fine because your um, area of expertise might not necessarily be copyright. And I think that's an important aspect of the things that we want to cover on the declaration. Uh, there are some important things that are going to be around copyright questions and then there are going to be some other questions that are going to be more around ethical considerations and community norms and how to navigate all that complexity rather than just copyright. And Amy is saying chat issues should now be fixed. So now you should all be able, um, people are saying not yet at my end. We really want to hear from you, but this is great because we still have the Mentimeter, so that's a great way to... <laughs> yeah, and Andrea is sharing there on the chat saying there are a lot of no, which is great to hear. And so if you haven't done so yet, please check out the spreadsheet that uh, Andrea is sharing there on the chat. Um, maybe Andrea, do you want to comment a little bit on what the spreadsheet is? Yeah, so um, I dropped a link into uh, a survey of um, open GLAM uh, instances. So sometimes individual collections or even entire policies of different cultural institutions and even government archives, universities um, that release collections online under open licenses or as public domain. Um, so if you are one of those institutions and you scroll down to the US section and you don't see your institution there, please reach out because um, we would love to, to include you on the list. This is kind of capturing the, the global picture of all the different institutions that are um, working in Open Glam at the moment. Yeah, and now we are, can move to the next question that is like, what are the challenges that you face when approaching open access to cultural heritage? So for all of you that said like, oh uh, yes, we do claim rights uh, over digital reproductions, but we would like to change that. Um, so what are the main things that, uh, main problems, challenges, um, issues that you face when approaching open access to cultural heritage? Resources, expertise for rights research, that's a good question, a good um, part. Communicating policy, resources, financial and staff to digitize records. Um, lack of provenance and rights research capabilities, not enough staff or expertise, and not enough time, right? Like that's another important question, right? Like it takes a lot of time to do rights research. Um, convincing leadership and curators to let it go. Oh, I love this one. Um, federal guidelines, resources for developing open source publishing uh, standards. I'm seeing a lot of um, resources here. Cross-border copyright issues, that's a good one. We have seen that over and over happening again, even for public domain stuff, which is not only copyright. I mean, it's like copyright, expiration of copyright, but that's great too. Uh, protecting the intangible cultural heritage of indigenous groups we work with, that's great. Um, thank you for being thoughtful about that. Um, loss of revenue from image licensing or administrative fair of same. Um, it is seen as a revenue source for um, the institution. No one knows what it is. I love that one. <laughs> so basically, lack of awareness, um, share authority and trust, um, tech support, 
uh, plus one for convincing leadership to let it go. Um, modern collection, so I'm assuming that a lot of it is in uh, copyright, no IP policy for the museum, lack of prioritization from other stuff. Wow, there's a lot of things. The unknown, little to no training. It's a lot of labor to do open access. Um, it is. Fear of what will happen if we allow it. Allow it. Differentiating between open data and open access policy, lack of provenance and rights uh, research, not enough staff. Um, our institution is much more conservative than we would like. We want to publish under CC zero rather than CC by. And this is the great, this is great. This is the reason why we're also doing the Mentimeter because you can share whatever is happening at your institution without sort of being outspoken there and um, losing, uh, being afraid of like saying what is the problem that you might be facing at your institution. So this is great. And then some people are like saying documentation that's a good one. So more needs for case studies, how to do damage control if there is a mistake. Um, so many um, lack of co cohesive damn strategy and tools. Um, prints and digital files take time and selling them supports that person. Great. Um, <laughs> frustration at the fact that we are open access and others are not. <laughs> so you want more people to join the crowd, share the love uh, for uh, open access. Um, this is great, please uh, keep them coming because all this information is actually super important and interesting. Oh, that's great. Uh, leadership don't like the quality of our images, but we don't have photographers to be sure. Um, we actually had a very interesting conversation about that today. Um, this is great. Um, please keep them coming. Uh, I'm going to move to the next slide because otherwise it's going to take a lot of time. Um, but if you're still hung up on that idea and you want to share more, please, by all means, uh, the Mentimeter, like it doesn't need me to be presenting that slide. So please send your comments along. And um, how important do you think these issues are when considering open access to collections? So ethical and privacy considerations, following technical standards, representing accurate metadata, traditional cultural expressions, accessibility considerations, and sensitive information. You might find that some of these things actually overlap with the things that you have also identified as challenges already. Um, but it's good to know what is specifically the weight that you are assigning to some of these things. And also um, you've sort of said there on um, the previous slide that there were a lot of challenges around documentation, training, uh, lack of resources, lack of awareness, not a lot of knowledge. And so this is kind of um, a different set of questions. So this is very interesting. Um, and thanks again uh, for all of you who are joining us uh, to kind of helping us complete this kind of very, <laughs> um, I would say like, very methodologically not appropriate survey <laughs> because we haven't established any parameter, but we're sort of like getting a wealth of information uh, with all the conferences and such that we've been um, kind of presenting um, this declaration. And we should actually add a new slide on the Mentimeter that is which one of our presentations did you think it was the best, right? Um, and last but not least, um, and please keep on, uh, feel free to uh, keep on filling in the uh, last slide. Uh, what would you like out of a declaration on open access to cultural heritage? Um, so if your institution or you as a professional advocate working in the space were to consider uh, signing on um, such a, um, uh, product or, or project or process or endorsing it, uh, what are the things that you would expect um, from, from a declaration like this? And also what is kind of the, you know, expectation um, of what are the things that we could achieve five years from now if we had this declaration? And I think this one takes a little bit more because it's like, there we go. Flexibility, dignity, respect, ethos of sharing, standards, decolonization, clarity, clear terms, some more definitions, inspiration, examples, community, 
I love that. Evidence of impact, yes. Stewardship, expansion, accountability, transparency in process, access, cultural rights, acknowledgement, case studies, protect, realistic. I love that one. <laughs> Teaching and learning, um, context sensitivity, wide buy in. Um, I would love to know uh, to the person that uh, say buy, buy wide in if there are like any specific thing that we should consider there. Unity, accessibility, ease of application. That's a good one. Knowledge, humanity. Um, yes, not only people on a Zoom call. Community center, yes, great. Um, thank you very much um, for all the things that you are uh, sharing with us uh, here. This actually helps our work a lot. Um, someone is also adding empathy for slower orgs. Um, this is great. Um, and please, um, by all means, I'm gonna now um, leave this uh, Mentimeter so we can actually go to the presentation. Uh, but um, as long as you have the code, um, you can um, um, keep on um, uh, keep your responses coming in. Uh, and thank you so, so much for taking the time to participate and sort of try to engage with us. Um, so hopefully this is a fine activity for you. Um, so now, even when you are still tired of hearing me because I've done this work of trying to be like a presenter of the things that you were saying, I'm gonna go and um, keep on talking. I know you're tired of me, <laughs> but I'm gonna uh, take a few moments to just try to introduce you to the fact or to try to answer the question, why a declaration? Why we think this work is important and why we have like so many uh, work put into trying to build this community. Um, so basically one of the things that uh, we wanna um, mention is that in the last 10 years or more of institutions uh, doing open access, um, there have been a lot of um, kind of events and evidence of some of the impact that open access policies has, uh, but also institutions have been more and more uh, being more vocal about what they are doing, how they are doing it, and why is it that they consider open access to be uh, important. And of course, I don't want to lose the opportunity to kind of like say again, thank you to Effie and her, um, Effie Capsalis, who is joining this presentation for her spearheading work at the Smithsonian that put almost like 2.4 million, if I don't remember incorrectly, objects in the public domain. Um, but I'm also bringing that example because it's actually kind of a great example again of um, how vocal institutions um, are uh, being about their open access policies. Um, Yes, and people are thanking Effie on the chat. That's great. <laughs> um, so we need to keep on doing that. Um, and of course, one of the other things that we still see, uh, despite this all institutions sort of trying to agree on their practice and policy, is that there are still very much a lot of barring practices in how to communicate copyright status of works across the sector. Um, so some of them choose CC by, some of them choose CC by share alike, some of them choose um, uh, other of the non-commercial, non-derivatives options that the CC license have, etc. right? Um, and at the same time, one of the things that we did in 2018 was sort of ask uh, some, um, some portions of the sector, well, how do you feel about all these principles around open glam that exist out there? And the, the answers that we receive sort of acknowledge the need to more nuanced approaches, right? Not everything has to be open. Uh, not all the things are appropriate to be open. And so there needs to be a little bit more nuanced approaches uh, when it comes to releasing um, cultural heritage. And also acknowledging that these things actually take a lot of time. Um, and another thing that for me is important, and maybe like I want to bring the fact that I'm uh, currently living in Uruguay and uh, I'm also from Argentina, so I come from the global south. And one of the things that it has happened in the like 10 years, despite that we have all this amazing evidence from institutions, mainly in North America and Europe, when we see the map, we still see a lot of gaps. And uh, of course, there are some things there to be said around like possible 
data biases in collection for the survey of GLAM open access policy and practices. But even when that might be the case, uh, slightly um, might be the case, uh, we also know that um, not all the institutions are necessarily bought into um, this yet. Um, and that like diminishes the ability of all communities to actually find themselves on the internet. And that's actually quite problematic from a lot of perspectives. Um, and so what we've done so far is kind of like collect some of these benefits and challenges um, and sort of wrap them up as evidence. Um, and this is the thing that um, Andre is going to be talking about in a second, uh, but I'm also putting this slide so people can sort of like see and uh, kind of um, glance through some of the benefits and challenges that institutions over and over and over have been reporting in case studies, in documentation, in webinars, and uh, talking with leaders in the sector, um, and uh, that sort of thing, we've been able to collect this evidence. And so if you go to openglam.pubpub.org, you can see some of the benefits and challenges that are being um, accounted there. Um, of course, we also want to acknowledge that Open Glam is complex and copyright, communicating copyright is only one of the many concerns that Glam institutions have. And here I want to acknowledge that we are also talking mainly with a US audience where the funding situation and the sort of like ongoing <laughs> um, unfortunate um, collapse of some of these institutions is taking a big uh, hurt on, it's like hurting a lot of people out there. Um, so this is kind of like very problematic and, and we want to acknowledge that, that if your institution is like uh, laying off staff uh, and in the middle of uh, coping with a financial crisis, communicating copyright might not be one of your top priorities. And so it's sort of an acknowledgement that there are a lot of other things that also have an impact on, um, on how you might be able to communicate copyright. And um, because of that, we also sort of acknowledge that uh, the way in which we have conceived some of this work is only as like sort of setting um, a setting stone. Uh, so this is only one step. Um, and then the road ahead uh, for us, it will be to actually provide more training on how to do some of these things, um, to build more case studies, to build more communications, and to build more networks that actually help the sector um, sort of buy in into um, the, the open access idea. And uh, with that being said, I, I want to uh, sort of acknowledge what is the role of open, especially coming from an organization like Creative Commons, that um, whose main um, area of work is the open um, more than the glam part. And so I want to make sure that we kind of like say what is the things that we do, right? And so I think that the first thing that we need to do is celebrate and support, right? Whenever an institution says, okay, we want to apply a CC zero on our uh, digital reproductions of words, we're all like, yeah, and cheerleading those efforts, right? Um, but we also want to offer some communication channels for professionals and advocates that want to share their experiences on doing open access. So we have set up the Twitter Open Glam account that is actually a guest curated account. Um, so we have every two weeks, uh, someone from um, some part of the world sharing their experience. Then we have the Medium Open Glam where we're collecting a bunch of case studies. And I highly, highly recommend you to go there and uh, look at the um, diversity of people practicing open uh, access across the world. Um, we are also offering trainings and resources such as webinars. We've been doing webinars with the MCN uh, Special Interest Group on IP uh, throughout the year. And then uh, more important than not, to create a space to have a more diverse, global, and challenging conversation. And now, finally, I'm going to shut up <laughs> and I'm going to give the floor to Fiona so she can um, uh, actually introduce some of the things that um, they've been working on in relationship to um, uh, the declaration. Hello, so I'm here from the Wikimedia Foundation, uh, which is the nonprofit organization that stewards Wikipedia, the free online encyclopedia that's created, edited, and verified by volunteers around the world. It's actually written in 300 languages. Its content is open access, and its platforms are sustained by donations from individual readers and editors. It's the only top 10 website uh, in the world that is a not-for-profit um, platform. 
And our vision here on the screen is to imagine a world in which every single human being can freely share in the sum of all knowledge. And I'm sure there's a lot in that statement that would resonate uh, with people working in museums, libraries, and other cultural institutions. One of the key phrases there is freely share. And really that's where open access comes into the conversation. As part of this mission, we want Wikimedia to be an essential infrastructure for libraries and cultural institutions, important for promoting language diversity and knowledge preservation, linking collections across institutional boundaries, and giving institutions access to our broad global audience. Access and use of the Wikimedia platforms is one of the ways you can realize the benefit of making your collections and materials open access. It's not just Wikipedia though, I'm sure that's the one that everyone is most familiar with, um, but many of you will have also worked with our other projects like Wikidata and Wikisource. Um, for those who haven't, just to briefly introduce them, Wikidata is a collaboratively edited database of structured information. More than a billion statements have been added to Wikidata. It's a sort of Wikipedia of data that provides a general framework for bringing the metadata, vocabularies and languages used by institutions to describe their collections, to bring that together and, and to create bridges between those institutions. It opens up new possibilities for discovery and connection across re repositories and of weaving institutional knowledge into the semantic web. Museums have often talked about um, finding ways to connect across those institutional boundaries and Wikimedia's platforms provide tools to do that very directly. Wikisource uh, is probably a less well-known project. It's a library of freely licensed source texts and historical documents, including everything from poetry to government documents, constitutions of many countries and general literature. Digitized images of texts and documents are there transcribed by volunteers. And when they're complete, they're made available as eBooks. Um, importantly, Wikisource is available in more than 70 languages, and it's the only transcription project that's readily available for most languages in the rest of the world. It's therefore a really important platform for both language preservation, but also revitalization, bringing languages into use on the internet. For more than 10 years, Wikimedians have been collaborating with galleries, libraries, archives, and museums, united by the common goal of preserving cultural heritage and sharing knowledge with the world. Uh, many of you I recognize in the chat for your collaborations with the Wikimedia movement. Uh, there are projects like the One Lib One Ref campaign, which runs twice a year, inviting librarians from all over the world to add a reference to the article of their choice on Wikipedia which both improves the reliability of Wikipedia articles, but also demonstrates a shared commitment to the reliability and verifiability of information, something that's very topical right now. Uh, the editathons hosted by museums and galleries have frequently focused on gaps of representation through campaigns like Art and Feminism, Black Lunch Table and Afro Crowd. But when we actually map our own content on the Wikimedia platforms, such as the Wikidata catalogue of the world's paintings, known as the sum of all paintings, we find that we actually have the same partial cover coverage as in the map that uh, Scan shared earlier. So to realize our vision of the sum of all knowledge, we need to collaborate with more institutions in under-digitized and underrepresented parts of the world to transform their institutional knowledge into open knowledge and for us, this declaration on open access to cultural heritage is a really important support for that process. Uh, it takes a global approach. It tries to build a global consensus around what open access work, uh, would look like and provides resources to help people engaging in that process. And I'm gonna hand over to Andrea now. Great, thanks Fiona. Um, Scan, am I taking control of your screen? Is that? Um, you you, you want to take control of my screen? You can. Sure. <laughs> um, can okay, you... great. There we go. Uh, yeah. uh, so right. So this is this is where the project uh, kind of comes into play. Scan and I and Fiona started having um, conversations about what a declaration might look like. Um, thinking about the fact that there's been 10 years of open glam, there's an incredible amount of work that's been done 
and um, having uh, a bit of a perception about kind of what that looks like and realizing, well, we still need to lay out all of the things that really need to be considered, the arguments that need to be made, um, because we're we're missing out on a lot of um, institutions and a lot of areas in the process. So how do we make this process um, a bit easier for everyone and reduce some of the barriers to entry? And um, something that, of course, we thought about was a white paper, like, let's do a white paper on this. So we start the research. Um, and I think one of the things that has that kind of started to then make us see that this needs to be a bit of a much bigger project um, is the fact that there are so many institutions and there are or organizations, community archives um, that haven't been able to engage in open glam for a number of reasons. Um, and there's a lot that obviously we could go into around that, but one of the biggest barriers is copyright and the question around copyright and all of the different um, kind of tier, fears and tensions that were reflected in the Mentimeter. So we thought, well, let's focus on copyright um, and let's look at the spread of institutions and what people are currently doing um, to try to kind of categorize and, and grasp where there's need for support. Um, and of course, rather than a white paper, it kind of turned into a research paper because in doing all of this, um, we realized that, you know, there's institutions and um, organizations that haven't yet been able to kind of enter the open glam sphere for various reasons. Uh, there's institutions and, and glams and different organizations that um, are kind of dipping their toes in the water and thinking about it, but still continue to claim uh, copyright in all of the different materials you know, that we're about to discuss. Uh, there's institutions that are maybe adopting a little bit here and there. And then there's institutions that of course have gone completely full open. Um, and I think a lot of the open glam discussion has been focusing on, um, you know, kind of the going forward and the exciting things that we can be doing, but we really wanted to make sure that in the process, all of the different approaches that were taken maybe had some sort of standardization that um, brought some consistency to, to users specifically. What are the ways that you know, we're communicating this to users um, that don't create a lot of conflict in terms of how they can reuse and access certain things? Because I think there's a lot of stuff that um, doesn't necessarily need to be open and we should be thinking a bit more critically around some of this and to, to kind of reduce the stigma around non-open and make it very clear that there's some content that just shouldn't be used and can't be made available in this sort of thing. Um, is something else that we also wanted to kind of con consider and capture. Um, so if I can go to the next slide, it's not, there we go. So of course, um, what is the paper's focus? So the paper is essentially meant to answer a lot of these questions and gather a lot of information together in a way that allows us to start having conversations um, and do some public consultation on a draft of the declaration that we then make work for all of us. Um, so who is it for? Well, I think GLAM, when we think about GLAM, it's um, a phrase that's been very institutionalized for very many good reasons. But when we think about the fact that you take uh, copyright off or you release things under um, licenses that people then are able to use it, uh, we have a lot of other people that are actually engaging in open glam, including Wikipedia, including even commercial organizations that may influence some of the decisions that are made behind the scenes during the digitization process. So really we wanted to kind of expand our idea of what open glam is to an audience um, that is anyone who is working with cultural heritage and making cultural content around that. Um, and especially even the public users, people who see themselves as engaging with the content. Um, we also wanted to think, what are our goals? And uh, some of those are what I just mentioned before, um, but we really wanted to establish some clear standards around what specifically open means and what meaning that should carry in a way that then allows people to kind of think, aha, this is okay. And some of these other sensitive questions can be set to the side. And um, also why now? It's really important at the moment because um, there's a few different legal changes that are going on, especially in Europe. We have Article 14 and the Digital Single Market Directive that's supposed to be kind of pushing everyone in the direction where no new rights should arise in um, faithful reproductions of public domain works. Um, and so we thought, okay, this is a, a perfect opportunity to make sure that Article 14 really kind of takes hold and that we make a lot, we provide a lot of the arguments and the data around why we need to be doing these things um, so that we make that process easier for people who are now starting to implement it and try to change the minds of um, all of the, you know, kind of the things that were raised in the Mentimeter, which I just, I can't wait to nerd out on and read more later. Um, 
So again, it's a big task and there's a lot of reasons why stuff can't be made available online. So the, the very, very, very narrow focus, which still ends up being a lot of content is we're only looking at the layer of rights that GLAMs do have control over. And we also want GLAMs to start to see themselves a bit differently when they're thinking about their own intellectual property and the different types of assessments that go into the decision about whether to commercialize that or to release it under um, open uh, parameters. Because there are a lot of institutions that may count themselves out of open GLAM because they think, well, my collection is all in copyright. So this is not something that's for me. Um, but we want institutions to think about their collections data and even other type um, of data workflow around digital, um, digital uh, reproduction, even for in copyright collections um, and different materials that could be useful for anyone anywhere as that's part of open glam too. One of the things we really wanted to focus on is building shared understandings around this narrow question of copyright and reproduction media of public dom domain works. Because um, this is something we really have to establish consensus on and different areas of the world have different understandings about what this means. And they also have different understandings about what it means in other areas of the world. So like everyone in Europe is like, well, that's illegal in the United States, you know, and it ends up being something where you're like, actually, no. Um, so we wanted to also kind of develop some of these shared understandings around what specifically should be happening with this content. Um, because, I'm sorry, there's a bit of a delay scan. I don't know if, part of the issue is once you remove copyright and because we've been focused on copyright for so long, you then think, aha, we're fine, we're good. But there's a lot of other questions that we need to be asking um, in relation to open that are falling to the wayside or kind of happen um, as uh, an afterthought because suddenly we realize, oh wait, this isn't something that we've been thinking about as well. And some of those questions will actually feed back down into the digitization process and make us think, should we be digitizing this? Should we be making it available online? So there's different ways that we can start to think about open glam as a methodology for collections treatment that goes all the way back to the actual material works. Um, so we really wanted to make sure that even once stuff is put online, those things are shared responsibly by users, separate from established institutions, um, for people who may have uh, different understandings or knowledge to be able to contribute, um, and uh, to bring that discussion into the, the research paper as well. And then the idea is that, you know, we've started publishing different sections of it as they're almost ready or as they are ready. Um, it's going to inform, it, it is informing the shape of the declaration draft and the final, uh, the process for finalization. Um, so the draft for the declaration is almost finished too, and that will be made public. And then we'll start a public consultation process, which Scan is going to talk about a bit later. But if you go to the uh, open glam pub pub, you'll see that the structure is set up in a way that actually begins to think about the different categories of institutions and where people are in their open glam journey. Um, but again, expanding that idea of institutions to smaller organizations, community archives, anyone who deals with cultural content and may have control over what they're doing with the data that they produce around it. Um, so the introductory materials are things that are supposed to set everyone up to be able to approach um, the, the resource itself background really um, kind of breaks down all of the different things that may influence some of the decisions. We really tried to focus on providing arguments for people. So it does take an argumentative approach um, to some of these topics, but also in the sense that if we don't establish consensus now, this is gonna become even more frazzled. And I think something that was great in the Mentimeter was thinking about what a mess things have been in the past um, in terms of like collection management and tracking some of this information. And we have all these different technology structures and infrastructures that are changing that then make that harder. We're really trying to think about like the future of collections management and how to make that job um, easier for future curators and people who are coming in into contact with some of this. Um, so then, you know, when you get to justification, some of the things that we focus on, especially in clarifying open, um, are about making sure that the user is centered in everything that we're doing going forward. Because, I mean, that's the point of Open Glam and that's the point of everything that everyone is doing. It's always about the public. It's always about sharing and making things available for people to be able to engage with collections. Um, so how does that meaning then communicate to the user what they can do with it rather than kind of capture what the own um, institutions may be understanding of that is? Um, because when you look at the spectrum of open, you know, it goes anywhere from we make our collections available online, all rights reserved, but that's open access because we're thinking about the platform rather than materials themselves. 
And you know, when you go along the line to that spectrum, for the user, it just it doesn't make sense. There may be additional restrictions in terms and conditions in various locations on the website. Um, so how do we agree on some standards that like help us and also help users? And then also remove the stigma from things not being open. Like we should just accept that there's a lot of stuff that can be made open. You can actually have access to it or maybe we display it online, but you can't reuse it in the same way. And so really that comes down to making sure that people understand open needs to be aligned with international um, frameworks that allow for commercial reuse. Um, but there's still that legal question about whether or not a copyright is appropriate in the first place, because we then start to think about CC BY and CC BY SA being used as a way to maintain the attribution to the institution. Um, and there's never really an intention to enforce this. I mean, we see this because this is still an open legal question in a lot of jurisdictions. No one's suing users and saying like, oh, you owe us this amount of money. Like that's something Getty does, right? But when we think about like how we're engaging with this, why not set people up to be better about crediting and referencing back to the institutions and this sort of thing? And how do we do that in a way that then removes the copyright claim that may not even be valid in the first place, right? Um, and then of course, in going through all of this, we started to see a lot of really, really important themes and connections and examples of good practice that are out there that are happening where people are asking questions around them. So accessibility, um, there's a lot of questions around what happens when you use a digital or you use a public domain work to make an accessible format copy, which then will attract copyright. And how do we think about that in a, in a different way um, than some of the ways that we've been thinking about it in the past, right? Um, decolonization and indigenization. So we really go through some of these questions and don't necessarily tell people what they should do, but lay it out in a way that people are able to make um, their own decisions and provide a lot of examples around good practice in the process. So everything that's in black on this screen is already published. The stuff that's in gray is forthcoming and the stuff with stars next to it is like imminent. Um, so we thought we would start publishing things in pieces so that people would be able to start digesting and reflecting on the content um, and more content will be coming. But essentially this research paper is there for people to either dive into individual sections or really kind of back out and read it from beginning to end in this order, um, however they would like to engage. So I think that's me, Scan, is it back to you? Yeah. Yeah, I just want to say quickly, and then um, um, if people want to ask questions on the side chat, uh, that would be great. Um, I mean, I see that there is like one question there um, from Kim uh, Foles, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, on uh, what barriers are in place for misleading information. Um, so uh, I think that's for you, Andrea, uh, because you were just talking about um, some of the, um, yeah, some of the uh, CC by SA things, I think. Uh, but basically I'm supposed to talk about the um, public consultation process, sorry. Um, so uh, we are still working on how that's gonna uh, roll out. I think that part of the issue too is like, um, we are kind of like doing these presentations in part to kind of gather a little bit of feedback from the sector, uh, particularly when it comes to the draft of the declaration, we want to make sure that we're actually delivering something that uh, people like it's expecting. Um, some of the things that we already have, like, of course, we have like a draft of our own that we're working on, but um, it's good to see uh, what people are actually needing. Um, and so we expect to collect feedback and comments um, and uh, on the declaration draft. But in the meantime, um, there are several ways in which you can actually get involved. Um, so you can go to openglam.org and um, you can also um, go to openglam.pubpub.org. Um, and so there um, you can actually um, leave your comments um, directly on the research paper. Um, but if for whatever reason, um, the only problem with that is that you will have to, well, it's actually not a problem, right? Like you need to make, have a PubPub account um, for commenting. But if for whatever reason, you don't feel comfortable with leaving uh, comments with your name, um, you can also reach out to us at info at OpenGlam and I'm gonna share a slide over uh, with the email. 
Um, you can also subscribe to the Open GLAM mailing list, um, which is where we mainly, ah, of course, you cannot see any of the links uh, because the, <laughs> thank you, Fiona, right? Uh, thanks for that. So basically, Fiona is now pasting all the links um, and they are in my presentation. I'm going to share the presentation again. Uh, but you can follow those like different mediums and channels that we have for communication, the mailing list, the Twitter account, the medium, um, the, you can write us an email, uh, or if you feel comfortable with it, please, by all means, uh, start commenting on the pub pub. Um, and then, oh, Fiona, you had um, uh, one slide more, yes. Yeah, I just wanted to sort of come back because in my earlier piece, I was talking about, you know, the importance of, of GLAMs engaging with open access so that they can take part in this vision of a world where everyone can freely share in, in all knowledge. And I just wanted to acknowledge that, you know, this process um, will present challenges for everyone. And I think in the work that Andrea and Evelyn have been doing already, um, particularly in thinking through the more ethical dimensions of um, open access for GLAMs, there are actually challenges that our volunteers working on Wikimedia projects will also need to think through as, as part of this process. So I said earlier that Wikimedia communities and museums have been working together already to address, address gaps in, of representation. But I would say that both the decolonizing work that's underway in some museums and the ethical considerations that Andrea is writing about for the declaration might demand that some things are actually taken out of view or reframed. You know, what would it mean to decolonize uh, the commons uh, for Wikimedia? So for instance, our image use policy right now only addresses copyright and technical standards. Like, is it in the right technical format? Is it open license? Then it can go uh, on Wikimedia projects and be reused. But some of the questions that our volunteers might also start to consider in, in view of this work is actually the consent of people depicted in images. The potential takedown of images uh, that depict spiritual works, funerary objects, or human remains. You know, potentially um, collecting and sharing more information about the provenance of the underlying work of art or object that the photograph is showing and involving source communities in the revision of metadata and description of images. There was one case recently that just um, really interested me where Google Street View removed the Uluru work uh, walk from Street View. They made it inaccessible, responding to a, a request from Parks Australia to respect the sacred site and to not allow people to transit um, that site even digitally. Um, for provenance, I could imagine a Wikidata project responding to Dan Hicks's uh, list of uh, Benin objects in his book, The British Museums. I think there's a lot that Wikimedia communities could be responding to as well. So I'm not here to say that we've got it all figured out and we understand open access and we invite you all to take part. I think there are things we can learn from galleries, libraries and museums. Um, and there are things we can sort of support them on around open access. So I imagine it as a collaboration and I think we're all learning together. Um, so back to you, Scan. Yes, um, great. Um, so I think that uh, um, one of the last things that I wanna say um, is that we're gonna have tomorrow actually a deep dive on some of more uh, specific questions um, so if you're interested, um, Andrea is going to be kind of like answering one-on-one -on -one questions uh, because that's kind of a smaller call and conversation. Um, and that's going to happen at 2 p.m. UTC. And uh, you have the link there. Um, but Fiona, thankfully, is also sharing it on the side chat. And the only thing is that you need to register and just show up. And uh, you're more than welcome. And we've actually been collecting questions uh, from Europeana and other um, uh, places where we have been uh, sort of putting this out um, to people to um, um, share their thoughts and ideas. So we're also gonna go through some of those. Um, and we still have 10 minutes left, uh, uh, sorry, 10 minutes left. And so um, Andrea, I think there was a question around uh, funding, if you had any, um, idea on funding and then i'm uh, seeing a couple more questions um someone yeah yeah i th there's um there's a question that says thoughts about funding which i'm actually i'm not 
totally sure what that's referring to. So if you'd like to do a little bit, maybe a little bit more context, um, happy to, to go into that. Um, but there's a few other things that people have said in here. And um, I think one of the things that's been really difficult, but also, uh, also maybe a strength of this process is the situation that we're all currently working in at the moment. Um, which is just kind of unreal with COVID-19, with all of the issues around um, funding for cultural institutions, maybe that's what this was in reference to, um, but how difficult it's gonna be to start thinking about um, openness uh, or even making these conversations when uh, cultural institutions are literally grasping at every single dollar and dime. And um, we originally had a completely different plan for this because we started this project around October of last year and starting to do the preliminary research. And of course had to take a completely different approach. And part of um, that approach was just thinking, how do we do the heavy lifting and the lead work to get all of us to a point where we can have a conversation around some of this um, because of trying to reduce the burden and the fatigue and everything in terms of um, you know, what we're all working with. Um, and I think something else actually that might be a, an interesting thing to kind of end on, I love that uh, Fiona brought up uh, the Benin bronzes because um, these bronzes, you know, they exist in I think 160 institutions around the world. And um, when we think about this as kind of like an example around open access, pluses, minuses, all of these types of things. You know, we have um, institutions that have digitized them and made available CC0, which is awesome, excellent. But you think about um, the fact that none of these bronzes are actually currently in Benin. Benin has been requesting them back, working on an institution to bring them back to Benin. And um, we, one of the things I'm really interested in is what this idea of a faithful reproduction is and how we're reproducing things and creating this narrative around a very flat encounter um, that then feeds into how we perceive it, in a, you know, in a copyright kind of context um, that can be completely disconnected from the work. But even the fact that now that we have all these images that are CC0 out there and people are able to use them and study them, including the people in Benin, um, if these things go back to Benin and uh, are there and they want to digitize them and commercialize them in the exact same way that the institutions that have been caring for them for so long have been, uh, that CC0 actually undercuts the market, right? So when you think about the commercial aspects of copyright and, and how that has kind of been used, uh, you know, in different ways and for different arguments and these types of things and who's benefiting from the possession of them, the idea of copyright, which is a colonial invention, which was created in the United Kingdom uh, at the beginning of the 18th century, um, now kind of operates in the digital space in a completely different meta level in terms of how we propertize and consider and understand these works and how we encounter them. And I just wanna, the book that Fiona referenced, oh, you can't see it because of my background. Let me turn it off real quick. Uh, um, Andrea, also, I, I wanna um, uh, ask people if they are still there and uh, still wanna engage with us. Um, we only have five minutes left, uh, but basically, if you want to go to menti.com, um, uh, the code is um, five um, eight. Yes, five eight zero seven. Oh, sorry, I'm starting to zero seven. Oh, zero seven nine seven eight. Um, and uh, sort of give us your ideas on what will help you to get your institution on board with the declaration and or open access. Um, that would be great. Um, okay, great. So just to jump right back on here. Um, so this is the cover of the book, which has an image of the Benin bronze. And the first thing I did, of course, was jump to see where the, you know, the copyright for the image is. And um, it says copyright trustees at the British Museum. So, so the licensing fee has gone to the British Museum to be able to use this image. And you think about all of the licensing fees and the aggregate and these arguments, you know, that we make around needing the, 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 the revenue and this sort of thing, none of that is actually going to the communities um, at the moment who are responsible for creating this culture that we all treasure and share. Um, so there are so many different aspects and layers, I think that we start to kind of unpick when we're thinking about some of these questions that, that um, 
you know, we just want to kind of open it up for discussion and think about what a more nuanced understanding of open glam and even intellectual property management means when the cultures that we're making these decisions around um, uh, may not, you know, be the people who are actually making the decisions for them. Um, so, I, and I think Saskia actually brought something up, which is great because she's talked about open science, she talked about open access and something that's really, I think unique when we were thinking about hope and glam relates to all of this. Um, all of the materials that are in cultural institutions kind of distribute among all the various open movements that exist out there, right? So not only are we thinking about how those materials specifically feed into those, but then open glam processes in general. And so um, I think open glam is a really interesting and kind of unique way, as, as uh, Skin was talking about earlier, to think about um, the, the collective influence that uh, glams and people who are working in open glam can have around shaping some of these movements to be more equitable. Um, and yeah. Yeah, another... and I think we are probably running out of time already. Yeah. Um, I cannot see. We've got three minutes. Yeah, we've got three minutes. Um, but if people can also help us understand better, what do you think are the elements that could assist you in your work towards open access? That would be uh, great. Um, and with hands-on activities, we're also referring to workshops and the like. And as I said, um, the Mentimeter is still gonna be running um, for a little more. So uh, if we run out of time, um, please, uh, your answer actually helped us a lot. And the same is uh, with the previous slide. Um, and um, if you have any more questions, come to the session tomorrow. Um, and thank you, Fiona and Andrea, for being here. And thanks, everyone, for being here. Thank you for coming. We are still going to like be the thank last you. two minutes, right? <laughs> <laughs> so people can actually like see what their collective response is. Yeah. Yes. Also, there's um, the someone clarified the question that says, I'm wondering if the declaration would address funding problems for institutions that have good intentions but lack resources. And I think this is a great one to end on because we all have good intentions, right? No one's out there. Um, I, th I think part of this conversation needs to be about being able to fail forward and think about how we um, you know, use what other people are doing to continue to, to build upon this and always make it better. Um, but funding is a number one thing, and that is actually up to governments. And so part of what we're also hoping to do is think about ways that we can create data um, or collect data that may exist among different institutions um, to be able to make those arguments at a governmental level, because funding is crucial to everything. Um, so I think this is like really the beginning of everything rather than, you know, saying that we have any answers at all. Um, but trying to create a space where we can work on all of this together. So yeah, thanks for, and with thanks that, for clarifying. Like saying with this is the beginning of everything, with that we end the conversation. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you so much for being here. Yeah. Bye. Thank you.